The concept of, of extreme citizen science can happen anywhere. Example of our extreme citizen science project is a project that Jerome Lewis is carrying out in uh, the Congo Basin. The reason we call it extreme citizen science is that currently most citizen science is done by very well educated individuals living in urban centres, mostly in the northern part of the world. There's a much greater potential for citizen science to change the lives of many other people too. And the scientific method and scientific standards are an extremely powerful tool for effecting change, for collecting evidence on the things which need to be changed. The key thing for me that is um, really interesting about this project is the possibility of using modern technology in order to assist populations who are living in, in very remote environments in a much, a much closer um, relationship with those environments than we do in the West. And so the real idea was to make available those scientific tools that would enable them to collect rigorous information about an issue that concerns them. We started to talk about doing projects with non-literate pygmy hunter-gatherers that will go around and will collect information about their area. We, we work with people who've never even touched a smartphone, who haven't even got an idea that smartphones and telephones exist. Those are people who, who have a huge role to play in how humanity as a whole adapts to uh, the context we now face as climate change becomes quicker and quicker. When we bring the smartphones into those communities, people are initially very excited by the prospect of, of getting involved. For each of the icons that we have in the smartphone, we've made a, a large version basically just so that we can show to the whole community what each of the images are and yeah. get people from the community to try and guess what the image represents. Um, and that we found is, is the most effective way of finding out firstly if the images are comprehensible to people and secondly if they're, if they're relevant. So this is the uh, Sapali icon actually and uh, what it's actually depicting is people skewering caterpillars on a stick so the caterpillars don't escape. We can see here that people are getting it, so we don't tell them what it means, we ask them to tell us what it means. And that's the way that we find out whether the icons we've drawn are actually going to be effective. What's very interesting is that the people who, who develop the greatest understanding will have an idea about things that they might want to map as their key resources. And then they'll come back with other requests. They'll say, well, this is great. You've got trees, you've got you know, sacred trees, caterpillar trees. What about honey? So they begin to get involved in a process of co-development of the software, in negotiating what it is that they want to protect, and in getting us to adapt the software that we've made so that it's very much tailored for their community. It might seem surprising that you think, okay, so those people in, in the extreme citizen science group developing a software that will be used by pygmy hunter-gatherers, how is it relevant for me or why are they doing that for a very small group of people? But the point is that technology have the, the feature that it can work across areas and you can learn lessons that you can bring back and they are relevant to other places. By empowering local people in these very distant extreme environments, we can start to create very important dialogues which will help us to be aware of the change that's going on and that's the objective of the Extreme Citizen Science Group.